The Old Testament reading that I selected for us today comes from Genesis chapter 28, and I'm a, some of you were my teachers growing up, so you know I'm a real last-minute person, and I could not commit to particular verses until this morning. Mrs. Prosser knows. So um, <laughs> our reading from Genesis today comes from 20, chapter 28, verses 10, till I stop. Listen now and see if you hear a word from the Lord. Jacob left Beersheba and went towards Haran. He came to a certain place, and he stayed there for the night because the sun had set. Taking one of the stones of the place, he put it under his head and lay down in that place. And he dreamed that there was a ladder set up on the earth, the top of it reaching to heaven, and the angels of God were ascending and descending on it. And the Lord stood beside him and said, I am the Lord, the God of Abraham, your father, and the God of Isaac. The land on which you lie, I will give to you and to your offspring. And your offspring shall be like the dust of the earth. And you shall spread abroad to the west and to the east and to the north and to the south. And all of the families on the earth will be blessed through it in your offspring. Know that I am with you wherever you go, and I will keep you wherever you go, and will bring you back to this land. For I will not leave you until I have done what I promised you. Then Jacob woke up from his sleep, and he said, Surely God was in this place, and I I did not know. And he was afraid and said, how awesome is this place. This is none other than the house of God, and this is the gate of heaven. This is the word of the Lord. I need to confess something up front. I I left my daughter in Oklahoma with some church grandmas, which is possible because it was modeled so well by you guys. Um, And I left the iPad with her, and then I tried to get some other device to preach from, and it's a failure. So I'm going to be a real millennial and do this from an iPad. A few days ago, I called Jay Vanderstoop, and I asked him if there was any drama or controversy or juicy bits that he could remember about Ralph's time as the minister here. And um, he had, unfortunately, little. But he started that conversation by telling me about his dad's involvement with the PNC, who had originally called Ralph in 1973, 50 years ago. Jim Vanderstoop, many of you will remember, sat right about there. And he was not on that PNC, but he was called in by that PNC as a consultant. In 1973, the PNC here at Westminster had found the person that they thought God was calling to be their next pastor. But there was a problem. The problem was that in 1973, much like today, Lewis County and Chehalis especially was a pretty conservative and very conventional town. And the pastor that they wanted to call was a tall, bearded hippie from California. (laughs) This is what what Jay told me. And they were worried that this bearded, hippie-looking guy would not be received well by the conservative, conventional folks at this church. So they brought in Jim Vanderstoop, who was, as long as I knew him, the epitome of conservative and conventional. And they asked him how they should go about introducing this bearded guy from California. Jay recounted that Jim Vanderstoop looked up on the wall in the Giphy room where they were meeting, and there was a picture of Jesus hanging on the wall, and Jim pointed to the picture, you know the one, well, it's in the entryway, I think, right? Long hair, beard, looks like a hippie. And Jim pointed to that picture and said, tell him he looks like that. (laughs) 
I laughed at that story because when I was a kid growing up in this church, I remember thinking how crazy it was that they'd gotten the stained glass window to look like the pastor. <laughs> because I thought that Ralph looked like that. But I didn't understand for a long time why Jesus had a blue robe and Ralph had a black one. It's true. Most of us who have been lucky enough to know Ralph know that his likeness to Jesus is not just physical. And while I'm sure it will make him uncomfortable to hear this and his children can all disagree, someone recently described Ralph to me as Jesus Christ incarnate himself and I did not disagree. While I was a little disappointed that I couldn't track down any more fun or dramatic tidbits from his tenure here, I was not surprised. Because as we all know, Ralph is a lot like Jesus. And while I was a kid at the time that he was here, my guess is that he probably didn't upset us as much as he upset other religious leaders. It's a great honor and a privilege to get to be here today with you, Ralph, and all of you who helped raise me in this faith on this 50th anniversary of Ralph's original installation. And when I was looking through baby photos, it's the 34th anniversary of you baptizing me. So I'm going to ask that we pray together. God, we ask that you would bring your breath here into this place. Let it rest on Ralph. Let it rest on all of us as we listen to your word this morning and give thanks for the blessing of colleagues and pastors who live out your love. God, I ask that the meditations of my mind and the words of my lips would be holy and acceptable to you this day and be for us a word. Amen. In the story that Robin read to us today from the Gospels, a woman has been caught in adultery. And she's been brought by the religious leaders in front of Jesus. Now, something that's worth noting is that the leaders say, Teacher or Rabbi, this woman was caught in the very act of adultery. In other words, they caught her doing the deed. Do you get my drift? Okay. They literally walked in on her. And whoever she was with, we don't see him. And they grabbed her and brought her to Jesus. Now, I don't know what the convention for these kind of encounters was in those days. But my guess is that when they walked in on her, she might not have been fully dressed. And my guess is also that they probably didn't give her a lot of time to put herself together or perhaps even put on some more clothes. So when she's brought to the middle of the court, surrounded by all the people who Jesus is teaching there and made to stand in front of them all, it's probably not her best look. She's been brought in in her nakedness before Jesus by the pastors and preachers and ministers and elders and teachers of her day, right? The scribes and the Pharisees, they're the religious leaders. They've grabbed her in this moment and brought her to Jesus, and they say, the law of Moses says we should stone her. What say you? Now, we should clarify that Scholars don't think anybody was actually stoning women for adultery in these days. And this isn't a real trial, because if it were, there would have had to be the other person guilty who was there, right? They would have brought them both in. It's, a it's not really a trial. We know it's a trap, a setup from the text. But it's still worth noting that whether or not they planned to stone her physically... They've done something to stone her spiritually. There are, after all, always ways to kill a person without actually killing a person. So while they aren't planning to literally kill her, they've brought her here to see if they can get Jesus to say something unbiblical. Right? They're, they're, they want to see how 
close to the text he'll stay with scripture and then stone her spiritually. The conventional thing to do when you find out that someone's been having an affair is to tell everybody about it, right? If we're being honest, which is exactly what they seem to be doing. And they're right that the scriptural or biblical thing to do, technically, is to stone her. And still today in many churches, the conventional thing to do when someone's been caught in an affair is to tell their pastor and to make them go before the congregation or the elders or both and let everybody know what you've caught them doing. Believe it or not, there are still churches that do this today. There are many in the town where I live that have this practice. And they will tell you that it's the biblical thing to do, right? The convention then, as it sometimes still is, would be to spiritually stone her. And in so doing, alienate her or cut her off or exclude her from the life of faith. But Jesus is not conventional. And he does not do or say the biblical thing or the conventional thing. Instead, he invites them to consider their own lives. And he says, let he who's without sin cast the first stone. In the late 80s and early 90s, when I was growing up in this church, it was still the practice at many churches in our community and around the country to exclude people who'd been caught in adultery. In fact, it was a convention in this community and around the world to exclude people who'd been divorced at all. At many churches, including many Presbyterian churches, you could not be a member if you'd been divorced. But in the late 80s and early 90s, when it was still convention not to allow people who'd been to divorced to remarry in the church, and when it was still convention not to allow people who'd been divorced to serve in leadership positions in the church, as elders or deacons, when it was still convention to condemn divorced people and to cut them off from the church, to spiritually stone them, if you will, there was a pastor, an unconventional pastor, in this town, at this church, a tall, bearded hippie, who when confronted with people who'd been caught in adultery or who'd been divorced, did not condemn them, but welcomed them into a life of faith here. And that pastor's name, you all know, was Reverend Carr. When I was a little girl, I went to this church we didn't live in Chehalis, but we went to this church, and I sat over by that post, kind of where Hank and Jenny are now. I sat behind Norma Zilstra most weeks. And my parents told me that the reason we went to this church was because this was the church for divorced people. I'm serious. I grew up hearing that all the time. This is the church that welcomed divorced people. For those of you who didn't know me as a little girl, my parents were not conventional. My dad was 24 years older than my mom, and my dad, before he married my mother, had been divorced. And when he got divorced, he was essentially excommunicated from his previous church, and to be fair, I've learned a lot since my parents died. I get it. I totally get it. But he had been divorced, and... He was divorced because my parents had had an affair. They're both dead, so it's totally okay. We can just talk about it openly. <laughs> they can roll in their graves. It's fine. But it was convention in those days that if you'd been divorced, and certainly if you'd had an affair, you could not be married in the church. And in many churches, you could not even be a member or serve as a leader. It was the convention in those days to spiritually stone people like my parents and to cut them off from the church. Church was very important to my parents, but my father had been divorced, and he and my mother had had an affair. So they were not exactly conventional. But 
we came to this church because it was the church for divorced people. This was a church that welcomed people because their unconventional pastor, Ralph Carr, like Jesus, refused to condemn anyone, even the couple caught in adultery. Well, I've never asked Ralph about this. I know that he, like Jesus and Paul, welcomed my parents and others like them because my guess is he knew, like our text told us today, that condemnation didn't lead to repentance. Spiritual stoning and excommunication did not lead to lives of service and love. He knew that, and so in August of 1987, Ralph Carr married my parents on this chancel here in this church. And then in September of 1989, he baptized me with water from that font that I bet he got out of a tap back there. (laughs) In the late 80s and early 90s, this was the church in town that welcomed divorced people and their children. And Reverend Carr baptized me and several other children that I grew up here with, that I went to Sunday school with and played bells with, who might not have been welcomed in another church. Because he refused to condemn people, any people, there are now generations of Christians who might not have known the kindness and love of the church and of Christ were it not for his service of pastoral kindness. I am a Presbyterian minister today because Ralph Carr did not condemn my parents. Because he was and is an unconventional pastor who lives and breathes and exudes kindness. In that story I read you from Genesis, Jacob has a dream where he sees angels ascending and descending from heaven. Right? He's sleeping on a rock pillow, which is a really odd choice. But he has this dream. He sees angels ascending and descending from heaven. And then he hears from the Lord, and the Lord says that he will make Jacob's descendants as numerous as the dust on the earth. And I know here it's not as profound an image as it is where I live in Oklahoma. But there's a lot of dust. And he promises them that all of the people of the earth will be blessed through his children. God did not have to show Jacob kindness. God did not have to bless Jacob or his offspring. After all, Jacob was kind of a cheat. Like the woman who'd been caught in adultery, and like all of us, really, he was screwed up. He lied to his dad, he stole from his brother, he was greedy and untrustworthy, and he was a cheat. And God could have condemned him, but he didn't. And because he didn't, generations and generations and generations of people came to know the love of God through Israel. Because God didn't condemn Jacob, but instead found a way to keep him inside the family of faith, you and I have been redeemed through this story of God's love. The world is full of cheaters. There are people who cheat their brothers, like Jacob. There are people who cheat on their husbands and their wives. There are people who cheat on their taxes, and there are people who cheat on their homework. Not in your class, but definitely in third grade. (laughs) The world is full of broken cheats, and we can, if we want, go around looking for them and catching them, and holding them accountable to the law and the Bible as we read it, right? We can bring them in and point out their failures in front of God and the church and let everybody know about how screwed up they are. And there are Christians out there in our world, especially the loud ones that you find on Facebook, you know the type, Mm -hmm. or TV or some radio programs, There are religious people out there today who, like in the 80s and 90s, want to spiritually stone people they catch breaking the biblical laws. And as Christians, each and every day, we have a choice to make about those kind of stonings. 
We can look at people who we've caught doing something that we think is against the Bible or that is against the rules or against the law, and we can choose to condemn them. We can choose to bring them in front of Jesus and all the people we know and have public trials to remind them and everyone else about how they screwed up. And there are certainly times when it's important to hold people accountable for their behavior, right? But there's a difference between accountability and excommunication. There's a difference between helping people make their relationships right and cutting them off from the tribe. And by the way, spiritually stoning people doesn't just happen in public forums, right? This is how gossip works. It's not always that we catch the woman having the affair and bring her into church half naked to make a stand. It's sometimes that we hear about it and then repeat it to people who really didn't need to know. But however we do it, we have that choice. We can choose to hold people accountable to our rules or what we think are God's rules in really public, shaming ways, and we can choose to cast those stones. That is the conventional option. Or we can be countercultural. We can be unconventional. We can be like Jesus and like Ralph and decide we aren't going to throw those stones. And we can create relationships with the people who've screwed up, We can invite those people into our lives and into our church and show them that whatever it is they've been done and whatever they've been told by other Christians about who they are or what they've done, they are still beloved children of God, worthy of kindness and repentance. And when we make that choice, We choose to ensure that there are generations of kindness, generations of love, and generations of faith. Kindness and love and faith, like the kindness and love and faith I experienced in this church that I might not have had it not been for a pastor like Ralph Carr or for church people like you. Jesus could have condemned the woman caught in adultery, but he didn't. Ralph could have condemned my parents, but he didn't. And because he didn't, I grew up knowing the love and kindness of Jesus Christ through this church and through you. And because of his kindness, today I am a Presbyterian minister without a beard. (laughs) And like him, uh, I pray that I get to pass that love on to my daughter and to the people that I pastor. My prayer for us today as we celebrate Ralph's legacy of kindness is that we might all seek to be unconventional. I know that most of us will never be able to support a beard like his or have those cool broken fingers, which I'm also convinced Jesus must have had. But we do have the opportunity to bless the world through generations of kindness. And my other prayer is that we as Ralph's church, will always show him the same kindness and love that he showed us. For it is the kindness of God that leads to new life. Amen.